Jonah chapter 1 is where we're going to be looking at this morning. If you have a Bible and want to go ahead and turn over there, uh, Jonah chapter 1, we're going to start there. Uh, we're going to look this morning at one of the more familiar Bible stories. Uh, it's one that we learn in the nursery. Uh, we learn the little kids look at it all the way going up. But still as adults, as we look back at this story, there's some great lessons for God that God gives us in the story of, uh, of Jonah and the whale. Um, we've been in a series of messages over the last few weeks looking at some of the more unlikely people that God used in the Bible that became effective and, and just really good servants of his. And this morning, I want to I look at Jonah because I believe that out of the different ones that we're going to look at, he's probably got an attitude that is more relevant in our culture uh, that became an unlikely servant that it would help us to understand that, that God can use somebody with Jonah's attitude because it's such, it's become his attitude so popular in our culture today. If you have your Bible with you uh, and, and open up to Jonah chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to skip around a little bit. But starting in verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. And he says, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah from the Lord, and he headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship. Uh, bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and he sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So God tells Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach against this city of Nineveh. And, and Jonah's initial reaction is, nope, I, I, I'm not going to do what you, you've told me to do. Because I don't really care what you've told me to do because I don't care about the people of Nineveh. And so he goes in, you know the rest of the story here, he decides that he's going to run away from God. So he goes, he jumps on a ship, he's going to run away from God. And as soon as he gets on the ship, they get out there and a storm comes up. Well, everybody on the, on the boat, they're freaking out, they're scared, and they start throwing cargo overboard to lighten the ship to think maybe, maybe this will help buy us some, uh, some time. Well, eventually Jonah comes forward and says, look, here's the reason why God sent this storm. He is angry with me. He told me to do something. I directly disobeyed him. So if you just throw me overboard, you'll all be spared. They're like, okay, sounds good. They take him, they throw him overboard, and immediately the sea is, is calm. They survive. Now Jonah's thinking that he's being cast overboard and he's just going to die now as a, as a result of his disobedience to God. But instead, he performs this miracle. He, he sends this big fish, this, this whale up and swallows Jonah. I'm sure initially he thought, great, not I'm going to drown, I'm going to get eaten to death by a whale too. But he, he ends up in the belly of this, this fish and for three days and three nights, he survives inside of, of this whale. And for three days and three nights, I'm just speculating here, but he probably prayed pretty hard. And he was probably, unless he ate something nasty in there, he was probably fasting pretty hard. And he was probably doing a lot of thought about the decisions that he had made in his life up until that point that had gotten him where he was. And his disobedience to God and his attitude towards God's will and his attitude even towards those, those people of Nineveh that God had told him to preach to. And, and Nona, Jonah, probably in the belly of the whale, did a lot of repenting and a lot of rethinking things. And at the end of it, I know all the little kids love that this part. It's like everybody's favorite part when you're in the nursery anyway, and the, the little kids part. Jo the scripture says that God caused the whale to vomit Jonah onto the shore. So he spits him up onto the shore, and immediately God goes to Jonah. And in chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it says this. In the Lord came to Jonah a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And this time, notice the difference. This time it says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, and he went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required, it required three days. So he goes to Nineveh, and he preaches the message that God had told him to initially. Through the little situation there in the belly of the well for three days, he changed his mind. This time he goes, and he obeys God. He preaches against the city of Nineveh, and... Instead of destroying them, they repented, and now God decides that he's not going to destroy the city. And if you look at chapter 4, the first couple verses of chapter 4 give us some insight into the mindset of Jonah. 
It says, but Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. Now, God had just saved the people of Nineveh. They weren't going to be destroyed anymore. They weren't going to go to hell anymore. And Jonah's mad about it. He's mad that these people have been saved. He says, it says that he prayed to the Lord in verse 2, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I know, I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Here's the mindset. Jonah. Here's the overall attitude of Jonah. He did not care what God wanted him to do. He did not care about the people of Nineveh. He didn't care that their city would be destroyed. He didn't care that they would all die and go to hell. He did not care. His general attitude was one of apathy. He was apathetic. He just didn't care. Didn't care about anything that God had wanted him to do in, in, in relation to this whole situation. And I think if you look at our culture today, even if you hone it in and look at the church within our culture today, you can see that same attitude. And you can see it running rampant in our society. And I'm going to do something that's going to cause division for, in the church for just a minute, and then we'll get back to, to being unified. But I, I want to cause some division in the church for just a second here. There's an age gap thing that's going on when it comes to this apathy thing. And I hear it a lot, the older someone is, or they'll point out how the younger crowd is guilty of this apathy and this I don't care attitude. And there's some evidence there that this is something that takes place within a younger within the younger generation's mindset. How many of you've ever talked to a young person it could be right here in church, out in the hallway. You make a conversation, you know, you're asking about them, you're interested in them, you ask them something. And, and their, their, their whole answer to pretty much what? what? I, I hear sometimes parents like, so where do you want to go to eat after church? Wherever. Like, you don't have of whether you're going to eat a cheeseburger or pizza, you know? Uh, then you ask someone, say, well, are you looking forward to going back to school? Whatever. Really? Whatever. Like you either enjoy the summer or it's really bad and hot and there's a bunch of gnats and you're ready to go back in an air-conditioned classroom, one or the other. But whatever. They get near graduation and say, hey, man, are you, where, where are you looking at going to college? You decide where you're going to go to college? Where do you want to go to school? Eh, whatever. What do you want to do with your life? You know, what do you want to do? What do you want to do as a job, a career? You're just going to get up every day and, and go do something to make a difference in the world. What do you want to do? Whatever. Would you mind if I took a cattle prod and put it on the back of your neck to get a little umption in your gumption? Would you mind this? Whatever. You know, and this, and this, you, you see this thing sometimes. And then I hear like the older folks and, and I say older folks and I'm in my early 40s. So I'm going to put myself over here because it, it annoys me too. When I hear this sometimes and I'm thankfully we don't hear it a lot. But when I hear this attitude of apathy, just general, I don't care about life. I don't care what I'm going to be doing. I, 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 I don't care about my future. I don't care about God's will for my life. And, and this is get, it gets real annoying. So what we do is, as older folks, we look and say, I tell you what, this generation is just in trouble. The world's just in trouble because this generation, because they just don't care. They're apathetic. I want to tell you that's wrong for two reasons. One, <laughs> All young folks aren't apathetic any more than all men are grumpy. All old men are grumpy. How many of you ever heard that stereotype? Grumpy old men. You know why it's a stereotype? Because there are grumpy old men. There are a lot of grumpy old men. They get up and they hurt. So they walk around with a bad look on their face and, you know, they're just in a bad mood. I know some grumpy old men. They're not fun to be around. But I'll tell you what else I know. I know a whole lot more jolly old men than I know grumpy old men. Because that's the people that I want to be around in my life, you know. I know a whole lot more happy older men than I know grumpy older men. And the same thing's true with young folks. You, can you look and find some apathetic young folks, some apathetic teenagers, some apathetic folks in their 20s? Yeah, you can. But I can also look and I can point out in this room a lot of them that have some ambition in life. 
And they want to do something with their life. And they do care. And they, they, they do want to do things for the kingdom of God and, and, and to align themselves with the will of God. So that's the first thing. Like We need to get over this whole, this whole generational gap. If we keep accusing a whole generation of something, all we're going to do is set them up for failure. Because then the only thing they're going to do is live down to our expectations with that. But here's what I really want to focus on this morning is, is with Jonah's attitude. He was apathetic. He didn't care. But God still used him. He used him after he made some changes in his mindset here. He used him after he tweaked his behavior and, and, and his thought process and his attitude a little bit. And what I want to ask you is, what's the difference in God using an apathetic man like Jonah and God using a hasty or an impatient man like Peter in the New Testament? Now, full disclosure, on that spectrum of apathetic and hasty, I lie fully over here personally and impatient. I looked out of the corner of my eye. I didn't know where Fran was sitting, but I just saw a head nodding and it was hers. I love you. Fran tells me frequently, she tells me frequently, she said, you are hasty. And I say, baby, I am decisive. There's a difference. There's not. Uh, <laughs> I like to just tell her that, though. I feel better about it. Yeah. What's the difference, though, in God using Jonah, who was apathetic, and God using Peter, who was hasty, who was impatient? We look at Peter and we're quick to forgive him. A lot of us are, are, that, that fall over here in our, in, in that, on that spectrum. We're quick to forgive him. You know, we're like, oh yeah, Peter had faith to jump out of the boat. He, he did, yeah, he, had, he did. He did it quickly. You know what else he did quickly? He took his eyes off Jesus quickly and started to sink. Hey, Jesus, or, or Peter, hey, he stood up on the day of Pentecost. And he preached the gospel for the first time and 3,000 people came. and They were baptized into Christ. That was great. He also, you know what he did a couple chapters earlier? He denied Jesus three times. So, yeah, in, in his haste, there were some things that God had to correct for him to be an effective servant. God had to correct some things in his life, just like he had to correct some things in Jonah's mindset. Both mindsets needed correcting. Both groups of people needed correcting. Let me use this illustration. My buddy, Kurt, and I, we duck hunt. We duck hunt together. Uh, we try to go every the duck season. If, if, if both of us are available, we're going to go. We've done it for 15 years. And uh, for 15 years, I've always had a duck dog. My first one was Reba, and she was pretty good. And now I've got one named Anna, and she's pretty good. And I've got a certain kind of dog that I want to duck hunt with. I like a chocolate lab that's a female that when I get them, I'm a little too high. And I know that. So I want my dog to be calm. And I want them to have the calm demeanor. And when I go to the breeder and tell them what kind of dog I want, I say, I want the calmest female that you've got in the whole litter. Because God has created these things to go and get a duck and bring them back. They are naturally like bred to want to do that. And when they get back, here's all they want from you. They want you to say, good girl. And then they want you to scratch them behind the ear. And if they do something really good, rub them on the belly. And you do that and they will... They will bring the duck back. Now, you got to train it into, you know, train them to do it the way you want them to. Now, Kurt, on the other hand, he got a dog a few years ago, and the dog's name was Gus. It was a male Boykin Spaniel, and it wasn't neutered, and, and it needed to be neutered, uh, not in the typical place, but right there would have been a good place to neuter this dog. Kurt's philosophy was different. He says, I like a dog that I got to woe up a little bit. I want one that's got the drive and that goes. Well, here's the problem with Gus. His dog Gus, he was wild and never got that trained out of him. He would, we'd take him to the swamp and take him hunting. He would boom, 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 boom. He, he was everywhere. It'd make you want to shoot him more than make you want to shoot a duck. I promise. His name was Gus. Named him Gus, make you want to make a preacher want to cuss. And uh, that's what we, <laughs> we nicknamed his dog. Gus eventually, he got out the pen. He got run over by a car because he was just shooting around everywhere. He didn't make it. Here's the thing. Had that dog had the time spent with it, that dog would have, he would have went and got a duck and brought back like he was supposed to. Had that time been spent with it and that wildness been honed in and that wildness in him and directed in the right spot. 
Well, the same thing's true of my dog. She's a little bit more laid back. But every day we take her, she goes and gets the ducks and bring them back. She goes and gets the ducks and bring them back. But a few years ago, we ran into a problem. It was towards the end of the duck season, and when we'd taken her every morning. She'd go and get the ducks and bring them back. She'd go and get the ducks and bring them back. She went out to get the ducks one morning, and it was two days left in the season. She goes and gets the duck. Instead of bringing it back, she went to the bank on the other side. She ain't never done that before. That was odd. I figured, well, maybe she's just kind of walking back on dry ground. And I trust her. She's smarter than I am, so I trust her. And uh, she did come back, but it was like five minutes later, and she didn't have a duck in her mouth. Now, I knew she'd taken a duck over there. We saw another one or two, and I sent her after, and she went and got another one, and she went to the bank again. And this time I said, well, I'm going to go investigate the situation. So I went over there, and, I, and when I went in to investigate the situation, what I found her doing, eating the duck. Now, for those of you that don't know, we're supposed to eat the ducks, not the dog. The dog's supposed to bring the thing back, and we get to eat them later. But she's eating, she's eating my duck. And so I took her, and like I kind of beat her off of that thing, and I went over, and I looked at the first spot, and all I found was feathers. I said, oh, no. So I took her back, and I wouldn't even let her go out and get any more. And I called a trainer buddy uh, out in Indiana, and I, I described the situation. I said, man, here's the deal. And I told him the whole story, you know, and he asked a few questions going back. And he says, all right, well, I know what your problem is. I said, what is it? He said, your dog is bored. I said, what do you mean she's bored? Like, we're actually killing ducks, and she's getting to go and get it. He said, yeah, but she's bored from you saying good girl." And she's bored from you, say, you scratching her behind the ears. And she's bored from you rubbing her belly. That means nothing to her anymore. She's not got any, she, she, she's almost become apathetic towards that. She doesn't care about those things. So she decided she's going to go get a duck and just eat it. We had to train that out of her real quick so that we could go the, the next few days and not do that. And... They, they make tools that are real effective. They got these buttons, man. These, mm, they, got, they got tools that make that effective. Like you can train that out of a dog real quick if you know what, what the problem is. I don't think that's very much different than us as Christians. Whether you, somebody that's on the end of the spectrum of the I don't care or got somebody on the end of the spectrum that's maybe a little hasty in their decisions or, 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 or impatient in life. As long as we're willing to allow God to train that out of us and, 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 and hone in our direction and where we need to go, we can be useful. We can be effective. We, we can be servants of God. That's what we see in Jonah. The main thing that we see from him during his time in the belly of the fish, when he come out of that, is he didn't come out wanting to go to Nineveh. He didn't come out wanting to go and do what God had told him to do. Instead, what he came out is he was willing to obey God. And that was the only qualification that God asked him. He said, go. He didn't say want to do it. He just said, go do it. You, you just, just be willing to go and, and serve God in that capacity. Be willing to do that. He didn't come out wanting to do those things, but he did come out willing to put his personal desires to the side and go out and do what God had called him to do. I got a preacher friend that he retired a few years ago and he told me several times before he retired and even a few times uh, after that, he said, I never wanted to be a preacher. Like, what in the world is wrong with you? And more so than that, he said, I never liked it. I never enjoyed it. And now for a long time, I thought, this guy's crazy. There's something wrong here with that mindset. But I stepped back and looked at it from another perspective, and I do respect the fact that at least he was willing to. He was willing to do something that, that he felt like needed to be done for, for the kingdom of God. And if we're honest, haven't we all been called to do things by God that we don't necessarily want to do? It's it doesn't really match my desires, it doesn't really match my will, it doesn't match what I want to do. But this is what God wants us to do. And it's only out of sheer obedience and being willing to obey him that those things get done. Like, like 
Maybe for you, it's going and inviting somebody to come to church with you or sitting down and sharing the gospel. There are very few people in life that they get, or even Christians in the church, there are very few Christians in church that are like, man, that's, I want to go and I want to go and, and, and invite somebody to, to church because there's this natural fear of rejection or this natural fear of failure. And there's a track record a lot of times of rejection and all this stuff. Man, when we do that, it might not be something that we want to do, but we can do it out of the willingness to be obedient to God. I, I would guess that, that all of us have been in that situation from one time or another. And here's the thing. Sometimes God has to smack us on the back of the head and get our attention so that we'll do his will. Every Sunday morning when, when we come in, I get to greet most everybody, just like y'all do, with a handshake or a fist bump or a hug or something. Several years ago, Grandma come in and, and she had always greeted me with a fist bump. And that particular Sunday, she gave me a fist bump and she just stared up at my head for some reason. And I was like, I felt a little uncomfortable. Then after a few seconds, she reached up and went, and just smacked me right on the back of the head. She smiled and went on in. I thought that was odd. You know? <laughs> the next Sunday she come in. She gave me a fist bump. And without any hesitation. She reached up and smacked me. Right in the back of the head. And every Sunday since then. That's how she's done that. You ever feel like God sometimes smacks you in the back of the head. To get your attention. With Jonah. He did it by having him spend three days in the belly of a fish and that got his attention he changed his course after that he was willing to obey God after that for us it doesn't work like that it's we're not going to be swallowed by a fish for three days here's where God gets our attention maybe we go through a struggle in a relationship or maybe we go through a time where uh we struggle financially. Or maybe we go through a time where we have problems at work or problems at school or problems at home or problems with, with a child or problems with a, a parent or problems with a family member. Or maybe it's a time in life where we've got an illness or we've got a sickness or we're in the hospital. Or maybe it's a time when we have, where we have a loved one that, uh, that, that passes away. It's during those times that God often uses to get our attention and to kind of redirect us. A few weeks ago, well, it's been several weeks ago now, Fran and I went through one of those times. Wasn't anything bad. We still in love. We still have, we still blessed with our children and the church and all this stuff. But it was just one of those times that everybody goes in life with, with these small things where everything in life breaks at one time. You know what I'm talking about? Like every pipe in your house decides to leak, every tire goes flat, every, you know, everything breaks down. And after a little bit, I mean, these small things, like, all right, all right, all right. after a little bit, it gets frustrating, doesn't it? One evening, we were sitting there talking at kind of the tail end of this, said, I could tell like it was very introspectively. She said, I wonder what lesson God's trying to teach us. And I couldn't help but chuckle a little bit because I'd been riding down the road for a while uh, that, that day. And I was thinking, all right, God, so what's the lesson here that, that you're trying to teach us? And so when she asked, I said, baby, I don't know, but I bet it will be clear soon. And sure enough, like within a, within a week or two, it became clear. And we learned from it and we got our bearings and we saw what direction we needed to go in the next season of life. We saw what direction we needed to go in the next, in that, in that next season. And the reason we can see this is because that's what God's MO is. You look at the Bible, you look around the church, you look in your family, you look at your own personal life, and that's what God does. Every once in a while, he smacks us in the back of the head through some that goes on in our life. Maybe it's a bunch of little things that go on in our life, and he gets our attention. And if we pay attention, he gives us attention to go. Because he's, he's training us. He, he's tweaking that, that behavior that we've got, that mindset that we've got, so we know which direction to go. I know a lot of you in here this morning are, are going through some junk. We've had a lot of death and tragedy in our congregation over the last few months. 
We've had a lot of sickness, and we, and we still do have a lot of sickness within our congregation. We've got a lot of folks that, that, that are struggling, you know, struggling with all those things that, that we just mentioned. What I want to challenge you to do is don't just have this mindset, all right, just let me get through this time and get to an easier section. Just let us survive this part of life, and then we'll get past it, and, and, and we'll move on, and, and we'll keep going. Spend some time to just stop and spend some time in prayer and just thinking and trying to figure out what is the lesson that God's trying to teach me through this. And through that, find your bearings in him. Find your bearings in, in, in Jesus. Find your direction from Jesus. And when you find it and you come out on the other side of it, be willing to go where he's called you to go. Be willing to obey him in what he's called you to be obedient in. You know, Jonah had the mindset of apathy. We look at the New Testament and Peter had kind of that opposite mindset of he was too hasty. God still used both of them though because at the, at the end of the day, both of them had one thing in common. It was something they had to learn. They had to learn willing to be obedient to God. That's what he's called us to this morning. Are you willing to? to obey God. Let's stand and pray about it this morning. Father, I thank you for Jonah and I thank you for his story and just including it in your word. It's, it's one that, uh, Lord, as we're little kids, it, uh, it gets our imaginations going and it gets entertainment. And Lord, as we get older and we can look at some of the lessons there, um, it causes us to, to stop and look at ourselves and our own and the attitudes of the church and our culture around us. Father, see maybe where we need some time. pray that every one of us, Father, will learn from Jonah, will learn from the others in Scripture that um, if we look at them from their attitude-wise, seem like some pretty unlikely people to serve you, but because they were just willing to, they were willing to obey uh, you use them to do some pretty effective and, and powerful things. And Lord, I just pray that as we leave this morning as your church, that we'll leave with that same attitude, that we'll leave willing uh, and just willing to, to be in obedience to you and your will. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.